Hello and welcome to the Axon Podcast, where I, Asner Midov, interview accomplished investors, entrepreneurs, business and thought leaders about their personal and professional journeys. In this episode, I sit down with Dan Primak, business editor at Axios. Dan is widely known for his daily newsletter, ProRata, and for founding Fortune's Term Sheet and Thomson Reuters PE Hub. We spoke about many things, including Uber's IPO and Slack's direct listing, Dan's life and career, his views on journalism, his bucket list, and other. I'll let you listen for yourself. Dan, thank you very much for joining the Axion podcast. Thanks for having me. I want to start with a quick overview of Axios. Yeah, so Axios is about two and a half years old now. Uh, we've been online for a little bit less. We launched two days before uh, President Trump's inauguration. Uh, the genesis of it really is the three co-founders, uh, all of whom came from Politico, uh, including our CEO, Jim Vandehei. Uh They'd been at Politico for years. Uh, there was, and it's been written about, people can Google it. Uh, there was a bit of a dispute over uh, kind of the future of the company and, and how things work with ownership and investment and all that stuff. Uh, so they decided to leave the launch new thing um, and, and and start to recruit people. And that was one of the first ones of those. Uh, but but the kind of the conceit, the, the editorial conceit is twofold. One, hire really smart uh, sector experts, uh, whether that's in terms of the White House, whether that's in terms of parts of business, parts of energy, healthcare, et cetera. And the other idea was this concept uh, the, that we term uh, smart brevity, which is that whether we came from Politico or myself come from Fortune, our editor-in-chief from Bloomberg, et cetera, when we looked at the analytics of what was being read and more importantly, how much of those stories were being read, almost regardless of what the story was, whether it was 200 words or 2,000 words, they were all being read for about the same amount of time. And what we realized was readers, even you know, voracious news readers, with a couple exceptions, you know, that Sunday New Yorker piece, generally weren't going to spend an enormous amount of time on each individual piece of news or individual story. Uh, and so how do we respect the reader's time, start writing for the readers rather than writing for ourselves and writing kind of for writer prizes? And, and that's kind of what we came up with. And, and the idea with our stories is you should be able to get the gist of it. You don't have to read three paragraphs to find out the point. We'll give it to you quickly. And if you want to go deeper on it, we'll give you that opportunity too. So the shorter it is better. Shorter is better. I, and by the way, there's, that doesn't mean to get rid of nuance. Nuance is important. There are certain topics. Look, we have a we have a science vertical. We have people who write, you know, about extreme weather, about uh, other really complicated topics. Look, some finance topics, some crypto finance topics, for example, are extremely complicated. We you keep the nuance. We put that in there. Again, we let people go deeper, but. Basically, if you can make it shorter, make it shorter. We would rather cut words than add words. A lot of times writers will real will write something and it'll only really be a couple paragraphs long or even maybe a couple lines long and then add a bunch of filler, a bunch of background that doesn't really help anyone, but almost because you feel, well, I'm not doing my job if I don't write 500 words on topic X. Yeah. You don't need it. The reader doesn't want it. The reader doesn't read it. And, and by the way, th- there's some history to that too, right? Which is when you wrote for print... When people wrote for print, particularly newspapers, th- there was actual space, right? You know, you need to fill a column, you need to fill a page. So there was reason for that. But online, there's no need for it. And what's your role at Axios, and what was your path to the company? Yeah, uh, so I'm business editor at Axios uh, and wear a bunch of different hats. Uh, the main two kind of public facing ones, I write the daily pro rata uh, newsletter, which is covers kind of deals and deal makers from Sand Hill Road to Silicon Valley, venture capital, private equity, M&A. Uh, and then I have a daily or, or Monday through Thursday daily podcast, the pro rata podcast, which is a little broader than finance, kind of covering the intersection of tech, uh, business and politics. And my path to the company uh, was I got a call from Mike Allen and uh, and I had been at Fortune uh, for six years. Uh, Fortune was kind of collapsing on itself al- alongside the rest of Time Inc. Uh, and honestly, I, it was a chance to join what I thought was a group of very smart people with a smart idea. And honestly, I had kind of covered startups for the, you know, the prior 15 years or so. And it was probably about time I joined one. And tell us a little bit about ProRata. I believe you just got your 100,000 uh, subscribers. On the newsletter. Right? Yeah. So the newsletter is kind of a, the latest iteration of something I've been doing, wow, for a long time, probably since 2002 when I was at Reuters uh, or what became Reuters, Thompson Financial, which then bought Reuters, uh, which, which had kind of always been this daily deals sheet uh, with a column at the top of it. Uh, but yeah, the ProRata newsletter is the latest iteration. And, and, and again, one of the reasons, to be honest, I joined Axios, I, I said Mike Allen gave me a call. Mike had created the playbook uh, newsletter when he was was at Politico, which is kind of the Bible of Washington, D.C. And Mike was one of the very few people in journalism who kind of really understood my job. In other words, I was writing at the time a newsletter we called Term Sheet at Fortune, which still exists. And the idea that 
you wake up every day, you have not just a deadline every day, but you have this kind of relationship with the readers because you're in their inbox personally with your name. But you also have to have this high metabolism and get this thing out every single morning, whether they're is kind of, you know, a headline or not an obvious headline to write. Uh, so yeah, we've got 100,000 uh, subscribers now on the ProRata newsletter, which you can get at uh, getprorata.axios.com. It is free. Um, and it, it's kind of, it, it, it's two things. It'll give you every venture deal, M&A deal, private equity deal, fundraise, et cetera, that happened that day, just kind of as a compendium, a good thing to have in your inbox to, to be able to back search through. And then, you know, if we're doing our best or if I'm doing it at best, there, there's something up top that's going to make you think hopefully with some news that you haven't heard before. How do you create this letter? Like every da- every evening you sit down and you kind of... I do it in the morning. We we come out at 10 Eastern. Uh, or I try to come out at 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, which is right before I start the podcast. Uh, and I'm kind of typing pretty furiously from about 6 to 10 with about 45 minutes in between to make my kid breakfast and get her off to school or summer camp or wherever. Um, but yeah, I... I, I the, I've done work for it generally the previous day, which means, you know, I'm on my phone, I'm on the phone all day, I'm talking to sources, I'm emailing sources or DMing sources. And the idea isn't so much that I'm writing something the day before, but it's I'm gathering enough information that when I sit down to write, I'm going to have stuff to write about. On the deal side, news often breaks, you know, at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., you know, news I don't know is coming. And so we try to be as up to date as possible. We, we don't want people to open their inbox or open their newsletter at 9 a.m. and be missing the obvious story. Do people contact you tell uh, like to break the story or to tell you about the deals? I mean, some of them get sent to me. Um, I've been kind of doing it long enough that you know that you know that there's kind of a rhythm to these things. You know, you know when there's certain yeah. publications to publish. You know when there's certain things that kind of go over the wires. Uh, I go through regulatory filings, SEC filings, uh, Delaware filings, things like that, and those kind of come up randomly. Uh, you know, and I've always got Twitter sitting up and, and and things pop up. So some stuff comes in. A lot of it I go get. What are some most interesting deals you've seen lately? Most interesting deals lately. I mean, you know, the most interesting in the last couple of months, obviously, is the Uber IPO. Um, if, if only because it's been anticipated for so long, uh, it landed with such a uh, an unremarkable thud on Wall Street when it went public. You know, this, this thing that's been a rocket ship for whatever it is, six, seven years, uh, and the stock hasn't really uh, moved almost at all. Um, I, so that's clearly the big, the most interesting. And on the big side, kind of the big M and A side, it, it's the incredible consolidation of healthcare. I mean, that's been the story this year. Uh, you, you've got um, AbbVie buying Allergen the other day, which is the Botox maker, uh, and just it, it's been remarkable when when you've got these particularly pharmaceutical companies. There's been talk for years about this so-called patent cliff, right? Like what you know. Mm-hmm. So AbbVie, for example, you know, what are we going to do in Humira? is no longer on patent and people can buy it much cheaper as a generic. Well, they're, they're consolidating and, and you're seeing these huge, you know, Bristol Myers buying cell gene, what happened earlier this year, you're seeing these huge consolidations. And, and the question then becomes not for the smaller pharma companies, because you have all these, you know, venture capital always gets talked about as a technology thing, but you know, 30 to 40% of the dollars go into biotech. A lot of that's in pharma, you know, these are mostly companies that want to get bought, not go public. And you're you're going to have a lot fewer big buyers. And in theory, you're going to have the opportunity maybe for one or two of these to become a bigger player because it's going to be a slightly more open field. So speaking of IPOs, so Slack went public. Okay, Can you kind of give us a little background on that? Is it like a new fashion to go public right. this way? So, so an IPO, traditionally an IPO, an initial public offering, the idea is a company is selling stock uh, to the public mm-hmm. market or, or selling stock to you know to retail investors, hedge funds, mutual funds, et cetera, and it's going to be publicly traded. Uh, Slack did something called direct listing, which basically means public market investors could buy the shares, but the company itself wasn't selling them. It was insiders. So early investors, early employees, et cetera, people who had stock as a private company, they could sell. Uh, so the big difference of that from a structural perspective is the company didn't raise any money. You know, when you hear company X raised $100 million in its IPO, Slack raised zero. In fact, Slack actually paid to go public because there were still some very small fees, not traditional IPO, Wall Street fees. Uh, it, it's newish. Uh, Spotify did this last year. They were really the innovator here. Uh, speaking to somebody who has uh, worked on the Slack deal, they said we basically followed the Spotify playbook. Uh, the the one, one of the things that's most interesting about this is when a company goes public in a traditional IPO, they'll come out with a range, right? Uh, we're going to sell our stock at $20 to $23 a share. And then they go and they build the book and, and then they price at a certain number. And it's kind of a guessing game. And then the stock might go way up or go way down on the first day. Uh, Slack basically does 
the way you do a direct listing, the price discovery is basically built in. So, you know, the price they go public at really is the market price for the stock. It's what Spotify did. It's kind of what Google did, you know, whatever now, 10, 15 years ago yeah. via something called a Dutch auction. But in that case, they were still selling the stock. It, it wasn't, it wasn't these so-called direct listings. And my guess is we will see some more of them. Uh, the, the conventional wisdom is you need to be a household name to do it, um, to be, to get the retail investors and Slack is kind of, it's an enterprise software company, but kind of everyone uses it. Uh, all investors probably use it if they're an institutional investor. The the name that comes up most and often right now is Airbnb. Will Airbnb do it? Might they even, and I wrote about this uh, the other day, might they even consider a hybrid where they do a direct listing, but also a, a partial primary offering or traditional IPO so they can raise some money as well? I originally thought that the reason they do it is because there is a lockup period in traditional IPO, but I don't think that's the case, right? It's not. So the lockup period, for those who don't know, you know, this lockup period is typically, you know, 90 days or 180 days that when a company goes public, insiders can't sell for a certain period of time. And, and that's, and, and that's to give new investors or first time or new investors in the company confidence, you know, the CEO isn't going to sell all their shares, or all the investors aren't going to run to the door and, and not only signaling a lack of confidence, but also create volatility in the stock. But but the lockup agreements aren't actually endemic to IPOs. They are agreements between the companies and their underwriters. Um, so when you don't have underwriters, like in a direct listing, there's no need for lockups because you're not making the agreement with anybody. But even in a traditional IPO, it, it's not a regulatory rule. There, there's nothing legal about it. It's, a, it's an agreement that you make with the underwriters, and you can get rid of those if you want to, negotiate them away. And you've seen some more innovative and, and shorter lockup periods lately. And I'm sure that, again, I'll bring Airbnb up because it's going to be the next mega offering. You know, you'll have Peloton in between and a few others. But if Airbnb said to its bankers, you know what, we're going to do this with you, but only if we have no lockups, there won't be lockups. So what's the benefit then? Is it just to be different or what's the story uh, there? Uh, of doing this, uh, there's a few benefits uh, of doing a direct listing. There's a few benefits. One, it's a lot faster. Uh, you don't have to go through a bunch of the registration statement periods. Uh, two, you do get this better, this more accurate price, right? Like w- when you see a company go public and it quote pops 20% or the stock goes up 20%, it gets great headlines. And it's like, oh, look how hot the stock is, like beyond meat. Oh my God, look, it's worth t- five times or whatever its IPO price. But those are dollars those companies left on the table and maybe even any selling shareholders left on the table. This is a, this is a more accurate price. It shouldn't pop 20% or go down 20%. This is a market price. Those are the, those are the big advantages. And again, from a traditional standpoint, you don't have lockups. Again, you don't need them with an IPO, but you usually have them. And also there are lower fees. You're not paying the Wall Street banks nearly as much. Got it. So, and technically slot can now go ahead and sell it, its stocks itself and raise capital for the company too, right? It could. It could do a secondary. It could do an official public offering as a secondary offering. I don't know. There might be some provisions in the Slack uh, documents about you know when it's allowed to do that. There might be a period of time. I'm just not certain. But yeah, they can. And lots of companies that go public, you know, six months later, two years later, do secondary public offerings. And Slack at some point may. Got it. What I want to do now is uh, learn a little bit about you as a person. And the way we're going to do it is go all the way back to your childhood. <laughs> What do you got for me? So where were you born and grew up? Uh, I was born in the Bronx of New York City, um, lived for a couple of years in New York, a couple of years in Michigan, uh, but mostly grew up uh, outside of Boston, uh, kind of closer to Worcester, which is in the middle part of the state. What was the place like during your childhood? So I kind of split time between Worcester and a town called Westboro, and Westboro is where I spent most of my time. Uh, and Westboro was, uh, you know, pure Massachusetts suburbia, uh, you know, kind of the, the church in the center of town, about 7,000 people or so at the time. The town's a bit bigger now, gotten gotten some actual businesses in there. Uh, but no, true, uh, true neighborhood, right? I lived on a block, and there was a bunch of kids who were about my age, and you went out and spent your day out in, you know, riding your bike around and in the woods where you could find them and, and and that's what we did. Were you the only child in the family, or you had I siblings? was only child. Yeah, and I have an only I have an only child. So apparently, it, apparently, it's genetic. Oh, describe yourself as a child. I'm curious to know about your personality. I describe myself as a child. Uh, let's see, uh, active, or so I'm told. Very active. Uh, like now, talked all, talked a lot. Um, <laughs> like um, was very happy, even though I, I was outside and, and playing around with friends a lot. Was also very happy to just sit in my room for hours and hours with Star Wars figures and and just do that. I apparently could shut the door and be in there for three hours, and no one would be concerned about me, and I'd be be very happy. Uh, and like I, I did like school. You know, I played sports and stuff, but I, I definitely enjoyed school. It was something I looked forward to. And what did you want to do when you grew up? 
I'm I don't think I, you know, play center field for the Red Sox. Uh, I don't think I, you know, I, you know, I, I see this and look, I even see this in kind of 20 somethings and, 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 and these quite, and these people who have this, you know, these grand, not grand plans, but kind of career plans. And, you know, I want to be able to do this by the time I'm 18 and this by the time I'm 25. And, and then, you know, what do you, you know, what do you, and I even been asked these questions, you know, in job interviews over the year, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years? I have no freaking idea. I, I, I give it absolutely. I didn't give it thought as a child. I don't give it thought now. Um, well, I thought you would say something like you actually mentioned that yeah, maybe you want to be a, a baseball player, you know? Well, yeah, I was a kid, right? I was a kid. I grew up in Massachusetts. I was a, at the time, long-suffering Red Sox fan. So yeah, I wanted to be a baseball player. I, I was under no illusions that I was going to succeed in that, however. Okay, that, you, you're realistic. Good. I, I, was, I, I wasn't good enough in my town to be the best player in my town. I sure as hell wasn't going to be an M, a major leaguer. Gotcha. What did your parents do? Uh, father's p- pediatrician. Mother's interesting. So my mother, when I was born or when I was a kid, my mother was a history teacher. Uh, but then when they moved to Massachusetts, this would have been in 1980. And it was kind of the beginning of the what was called at the time the high tech revolution, which was mostly Massachusetts on Route 128 in Massachusetts. So my mother uh, went, took like a couple extension classes at, at Harvard, and she turned herself into a, into a tech person, uh, really more kind of a technical writer. So doing, you know, manuals and stuff like that, but for big kind of very complicated technology companies, uh, she ended up working for uh, thinking machines in Boston, which was kind of cutting edge. She was at Wang Labs for quite some time. Uh, and so those sorts of companies. So I guess that's where you were able to observe some writing. On tech uh, some writing, yeah. And, and my uncle was a journalist uh, who uh, ultimately ended up as a columnist at the Boston Herald when I was a kid. Uh, and, and I liked going to, to the Herald every now and then, the old newsroom, and seeing that. Uh, but yeah, no, look, writing was important uh, when I was a kid. It was my mom's job. And, and, you know, if you looked at my grades over the years, you will see math grades that get progressively worse over time. And, <laughs> you know, English slash writing grades that get progressively better. I'm assuming you were a good student. It's just your English was better than math. I was a good student, but on things I didn't care about, and admittedly, math was one of them. I did not give, uh, I, I didn't give it a hell of a lot of effort. I guess is the best way to put it. So then you decided to pursue political science degree at <laughs> Haverford College. Yeah. So I, I took a year off after high school, and, and this this is relevant, I guess, to what I ultimately do for a living now. So I, I took a year off after high school to do something called City Year in Boston, which is. Uh, best way to describe it is kind of like an urban peace corps. And and for your listeners who know what AmeriCorps is, uh, this was the program that AmeriCorps was actually based on. Uh, City Year was first, and then AmeriCorps, which uh, Bill Clinton observed uh, City Year when he uh, was campaigning for president, and he kind of helped base AmeriCorps on it. Uh, so I did City Year for a year, and, and I was a lot of people in city are and kind of all of them now are in schools, but I was on a team that was kind of this jack of all trades in a pretty rough neighborhood of Boston. Uh, so, you know, a tree falls on a school, we would go get it uh, and take it off and, and we would rehab, you know, old drug houses, et cetera. But we also got asked, uh, we had a little neighborhood action committee and we got asked to start a newspaper. Uh, there was a feeling that all the news coming out of the neighborhood was negative. They said, oh, could you start us a newspaper that tells some of the better stories coming out of here? Uh, we thought that sounded boring. We thought, let's start an actual newspaper, but a newspaper about, you know, about the community. And that's what we did. And so that was my first kind of journalism job. You know, I, I had helped run the student newspaper in high school, but, but that was kind of the first professional one and hustling for ads. And then, yeah, went to, went to college in Philadelphia, uh, Haverford College in Philadelphia. And, uh, and political, so I, I was always a political junkie, so it seemed like the obvious thing. There was no journalism program there. And what's the name of that newspaper? Bury? Is it the one? Oh, the one, the one that we ran uh, in Roxbury, Dorchester. Yeah, it was called the Bury. It survived, I think, two years after uh, after I moved on. Yeah, it was it was good. It was a it was a triweekly, which isn't really a thing, but that's all we could afford uh, was to publish it every three weeks. Uh, yeah, and it, it was aimed. At, it was kind of news you can use. It was aimed at people kind of fifteen to twenty five in those neighborhoods. And again, this is pre internet, so th- there wasn't uh, there wasn't other news for the you know news options for, for that was aimed at that audience. So how did you end up in the Reuters? It's an interesting thing. So I, I graduate college and decide to follow a girl to New York City. I had originally thought I'd move back to Boston, but I instead follow a girl to New York City. Um, and I realized once I get to New- getting to New York, wow, these apartments are expensive. And I, even though the shower stall is physically in the kitchen, I'm going to need a job. Uh, and I wanted a writing job, a journalism job. 
Uh, so I applied to all sorts of ridiculous things. Um, but one of them was, uh, what was at the time, I think it was called Securities Data Publishing, which was owned by Thomson Reuters, or by Thomson Financial, again, which later became Reuters. And it was a, it was a series of these little trade print newsletters focused on, one was on asset-backed securities, one was on, secur- on, on mortgage-backed securities, one was on private placements of debt. And so I get this job covering private placements of debt. Uh, I knew nothing about business. I have learned since that the reason I was hired was twofold. One, they thought I was a decent writer. But the real reason I was hired was I had previously worked as a deputy press secretary on a congressional campaign for a very wealthy candidate. And the hire, the, the editor who hired me felt that when he kept getting these young 20-something reporters making you know, 20, 30 grand a year in New York, they were having a real hard time when they were interviewing, you know, the Carl Icons of the world, just the, the power differential, yeah. the money differential. His feeling was, since I had just worked hand in glove with a very rich person, I would be able to interview very rich people and, and, and you know, keep my shit together. So, so that's why I got hired. It was a print newsletter. Uh, I did it for a little while. A job opened up on another newsletter covering venture capital. And this was right before the dot-com crash. So I jumped at it. And you've interviewed a lot of people over the years. Uh, I've been doing this way too long. I've been doing this 20 years. So yeah, I interviewed everybody who's out there, I guess, over that time. Whose interview you remember very well and you're like, oh man, this is... Well, I, I remember a very early interview with Zuckerberg, if, if only because I, I, I look back at it now and I can't find the story because I think it only appeared probably in, a, in our print newsletter. But I would think, wow, that was one of the earlier interviews with him. Uh, you know, I just mentioned Carl Icahn. He was an impressive interview just because the way it happened was uh, I had never spoken to him before. And we were going to have him on stage at a conference that I was, so I was going to interview him at a conference. Uh, so the night before uh, I call him or he calls me to prep for the interview, uh, we end up only talking about baseball. He's a Yankees fan and I'm a Red Sox fan. So we talk about baseball for 30 minutes and then he says, okay, we'll be good for tomorrow. I think, shit, we haven't talked at all about what we're doing on stage. All right, good. But then I think it doesn't matter because before these onstage interviews, you always have five or 10 minutes, right? You know, in a green room. But we're at a hotel, it, this conference is at a hotel ballroom in New York. I can't remember which hotel. Um, I'm standing outside the ballroom. He's not there. He's not there. You know, we're supposed to be on stage at 520 or whatever it is. Still not there. Still not there. You know, the organizers are panicked. I'm on my cell phone. I, I call his assistant, who's always his longtime assistant. And she says, well, he walked over and people like to stop him on the street. I said, will he be here? She said, he'll be here. No doubt, no joke. 30 seconds before we're supposed to go on stage, I see him walk through the main doors of the hotel he yeah, sees me. I, I don't know how he knew who I was, but he sees me, puts his hand on my shoulder and said, let's go. The man never broke stride. And we went right in. We walked down the <laughs> aisle way. It was like a wedding, the aisle way of the conference and got on stage and, and did the interview. And it was great. Yeah, I saw the interview. I think he was sitting there He's sipping it? a little drink. Yeah, right. Is it, was it might, might have been. Yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah, it, it's on YouTube. I thought it was funny. Yeah. Is it correct that you are the person behind the PE Hub? Uh, yeah. So when I was at, again, what became Reuters, uh, we launched PE Hub or I launched PE Hub. God, I can't even remember the year. I'm going to guess like 2007, maybe. That sounds about right. 2006, 2007. Yeah, we launched it. I mean, it was an early blog, basically. You know, it was a pretty relatively early website for, for private equity, maybe the only one that was covering private equity at the time. And, you know, kind of was using what at the same time was becoming the Huffington Post model of kind of this contributor network where the contributors could actually access the system and could plug, you know, and, and could write in there and then we would edit it. So yeah, we created that. Um, we weren't able really with Reuters to get the funding for it that it needed to actually become good, uh, which is ultimately why I left Reuters. Uh, I, I left Reuters uh, in, 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 in an, a little bit of an angry storm of, uh, <laughs> a, 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 of peak for not being able to hire some people I wanted to hire. And then you joined Fortune. Or... Yeah, I joined Fortune. I, there's a guy I, I had considered, uh, or, or I had had talks is a better way to put it, uh, about a year earlier, joining or a year and a half earlier, joining something called Portfolio, which was a magazine, a short-lived mag- business magazine that Condé Nast created. Um, and one of the people who I spoke to during that process was somebody named Dan Roth, who was early at Portfolio. And Dan wanted to hire me there, and it didn't work out. Uh, and then Dan ended up back at Fortune where he had been before. Uh, and when he heard things that, that I wasn't thrilled at Reuters, he, he gave a call and, and, and got things together. And Dan now is the person who's kind of behind all the editorial content on LinkedIn. Uh, impressive guy. Um, but yeah, I ended up over at Fortune, uh, which was a great opportunity. Particularly, you know, I was I kind of got, from my perspective, to graduate to the big leagues. Uh, Reuters is obviously a big place. But, um, you know, I've been covering really, really 
uh, pretty esoteric trade sort of content and going to fortune was a much bigger platform and gave me an ability to do more stuff. Uh, the editor at the time, Andy Server gave me, a, a was it a, maybe an every other issue column that was kind of whatever I wanted it to be about. So I got to do a lot more stuff. And then you founded the term sheet, right? I founded the term sheet there. I created something at Reuters that we call PE hub wire or PE week wire originally, which was a similar sort of news, uh, a kind of similar newsletter and and i and i brought i didn't bring the list over because i was never allowed to move the list um but yeah we created a term sheet which was really what they wanted they they were trying to figure out their online strategy fortune at one point started a huge online project and then killed it and fired everybody and then started again then fired everybody and i was you know phase three or phase four of that to be brought in to try to fix things again how would you compare prorata to a term sheet to the uh p wire uh, I, I'd say it's an evolution of it, right? Some of it's the same, uh, you know, kind of the, these venture capital deal notes, et cetera. Um, although I think we're more, I think progressively, we I keep getting more comprehensive, uh, particularly on kind of the broader mergers and acquisition side. Um, there's, it's structurally a little bit different. You know, there, there's data charts in it that there weren't before. There, we kind of highlight a deal and really get in depth in it each day. Um, I think it's... Like the prior one, it's it's a bit snarky. I think again, when it, when it's doing its job the best, uh, somebody once described it as a combination between uh, kind of People Magazine and The Economist. We, we kind of you know we're, we're it's important information. It's detailed. It's smart, um, but it's also fun and it's quasi and, and it's a little bit gossipy. Um, and I think I don't know if it's because I'm part of Axios or because business has become more political, but it's definitely more political than it probably was you know five years ago. A term sheet. But again, I, I remember, you know, years ago, particularly when Mitt Romney ran for president, right? And, and Romney had been a big private equity executive. So I covered that campaign, you know, not as an embed or anything, but I wrote about it a lot in Romney's history of Bain Capital. And, and I would get emails constantly, you know, why are you writing about politics? Stop writing about politics. Whereas now nobody questions that anymore, right? Like everything is about, you know, in, in the deals world, you know, antitrust regulations or on the business side, tariffs and, and Trump, like, the, there is no daylight between those things anymore. And, and I think the column now reflects that. And this fits you perfectly, right? Because that's what your major was. That's, you said you were a political junkie. It does. And look, I, I, I think, you know, that some people have asked me, you know, you know, why did you pick this beat or why do you write this beat? And it, it's not because I have a particular affinity for it. I, I think that there's always, whether it's this or it's sports or it's other things, there's often kind of winners and losers and a story behind it and why you get there. And But more important than that is how do the stories we're telling and the topics we're covering not just affect the professional lives of the readers, because obviously they do and people need this information to do their jobs, but also how does it affect you know, kind of them or society more broadly, you know, take venture capital and private equity. Yeah, when a deal does well, the, the individual investors get rich, right? And, and you know, they, they buy another penthouse. But the, the real underlying investors in these things are often, you know, teacher pension funds and, and private charities that need these returns in order to do the important work they're doing. So, so these things matter in a broader scale. And, and obviously some of these political issues and, and which are societal issues also matter in a broader scale, right? You know, the, the, you know, we wrote a story, I wrote a story today uh, about the uh, children's detention facility in Homestead, Florida, which is where a lot of these unaccompanied minors are getting put and kind of the money behind it and, and kind of how that facility came to be. Yeah, I saw the story. I didn't realize that it can be for profit facility. It's it's unusual and it's owned by private equity. And and to be honest, compared to when I started covering this stuff, you know, fifteen, twenty years ago when private equity was still fairly I don't want to say unknown, but but you know, private equity wasn't everywhere. Private equity at this point is kind of it's got its fingers in everything. It it's it owns the rest you know, private equity firm probably owns the restaurant you ate at tonight, probably owns the mattress you slept on tonight, or not the mattress itself, but the company that made the mattress, you know, the potentially, you know, the the hotel you're staying at, maybe the house you live in. You know, the the largest landlord in America is now the Blackstone Group. What's your relationship with these private equity funds that you kind of cover? Are you guys friends or you kind of look at them as more, well, it's subject? Well, they're not friends. They I, we're not friends. I, I wouldn't, I don't think there's anybody I cover that I would consider myself to be friends with in the sense of I don't, you know, go and hang out on Saturday with anybody I cover. And, and one of the, you know, the downside of living outside of Boston as opposed to in New York or in San Francisco is, you know, I, I'm not at the cocktail parties every night. And, and almost everybody I know who covers these things, for example, who lives in, in the Bay Area is either married to or dating or the brother, or the sister or best friends with somebody <laughs> in the industry. I don't have any of that, right? You know, my, my friends don't do this stuff for a living. They don't read what I write. They could care less what I do for a living. Um, 
but you know, so so these aren't friends. I I think depending on the firm, there's certain people who actively dislike me and won't take my calls. There's certain people who who like me a lot, but I think the vast majority, you know, they take my calls and they they respond to me, which is kind of all I can ask for as a reporter, and they know I'm covering them. I, I'm going to be fair. I will give them, I think they most of them feel I will give them, not the benefit of the doubt, but I'll give them a fair hearing. But if I think they've done something bad, I'll say they did something bad. If I think they did something good, I'll say they did something good. I Again, I don't have any skin in the game. So... And, and I've been doing this long enough that if there's a bridge that gets burned, it's, it's not going to burn me too bad. Uh, you don't have a training as a journalist. Do you think it helps you or it hurts you? I don't know. You know, when I said earlier that, you know, I, I, I'm always, uh, I don't know if the word's impressed, but surprised or at least a little bit befuddled when people have, when, when young people have these defined career paths. It's also when I hear about kind of, you know, mentor-mentee relationships, because I, I didn't have one of those and didn't see, seek one out. I kind of, I don't know, I think maybe it's the fact that when I was a kid, I read newspapers a lot. You know, we get, we, uh, it was back in the time where we got the Boston Globe that was on the steps when I woke up in the morning. And then we had something called the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, which was the afternoon newspaper, right? Because you don't know what happened during the day, no internet and you know, not, no 24 hour cable networks. Uh, so I read that when I got home from school at the end of the day. So I, I think I kind of learned journalism in part just by reading a lot. Just, it was kind of ingrained in me of, you know, this is how journalism sort of works. And I'm an inquisitive person. I like asking people questions uh, and kind of telling a story behind that. How do you define journalism? I think journalism is telling a story, a factual story, right? Not a fantasy story, but it's telling a factual story and explaining to readers kind of why they should care. And, and it doesn't have to be explicit. I know Axios, you know, we, we literally say why it matters. You know, that, that's kind of a, we call it an axiom uh, internally. But, you know, I, I think whether you make it explicit or not, give a reason for the person to care. That might be an emotional reason. That might be a pocketbook reason. That might be something else, but something that should be important to a reader and, and then kind of tell the story behind it, explain it to them. And by the way, do it in a way that they then are going to tell their friends. How do you check your biases when you write a story? I'm sure, I mean, you're human. I am human. I, I've always written, you know, not not necessarily in magazine pieces of fortune, but at least in my newsletter, uh, I've always written in the first person. Uh, I think it's an important thing. At least for me, it's been an important thing to do. I think readers have a general sense of who I am and, and regular readers have a general sense of where those biases are, whether those be kind of political philosophy, business philosophy, et cetera. Uh, I don't, I, I want to be, I, I will be fair. I won't, exclude information that doesn't support my argument or et cetera. I, I think it's, I think it's very important even to say, look, I believe this and here's all the reasons why you could say I'm wrong. That's important. But look, I, I think we all have biases. You try not to let them overwhelm what you write. Uh, you try not, I think there's a difference between biases and passions perhaps. Uh, and, and you can be passionate about something and, and still be fair about it. Uh, but again, I, readers kind of know where I'm coming from, and, and I don't hide it because I want readers to be able to take what I write and put it in the context of who I am and what I generally think, and then they can make their draw their own conclusions. And there's plenty of people, I get plenty of emails on a regular basis of you know, people telling me I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, and that's fine. That, that, you know, these are things we, we, we discuss and debate, and my email feed, my, you know, my email back and forths are more interesting probably than the columns. What do you think is the most difficult thing about your profession? Uh, the pressure to not be wrong, right? Like, you know, I, I, I hit send on the newsletter every morning. The minute I hit send, 100,000 people get it. Um, that's a big responsibility. You know, that's, you know, it's whatever. That's a couple of football stadiums full of people uh, who all get this thing. And we have a very good open rate. So a lot of people read it. Um, don't screw up. Uh, you know, it's a pretty, you know, this isn't old time newspapers where we have, you know, hours and hours before you go to press and it goes through, you know, Daily newsletter writing, it's a pretty quick turnover process. Uh, and so I've got, a, I've got a big responsibility, not only to not screw up for the subjects, but also for my company and for myself, right? You screw up too many times. You asked about biases. One of the reasons why I think I can write in first person, one of the reasons I still have readers is I haven't screwed up so much, the readers have left me. If, if I you know, had to put out a serious correction every two days, or if I kept writing things that everyone looked at and said, well, that makes no sense, I wouldn't have readers anymore. Why, why would you read it? And then, so, so basically, every time you hit send, your, your career, to a certain extent, is on the line. Oh, look, that's a lot of pressure. How do you think journalism has changed during your career? Journalism's changed, certainly, in the speed of it. Um, you know, and again, I wasn't doing an email newsletter back then, either. So the speed of it, for sure, right? There, there is... I don't want to say there's less time for reflection, because I, I think that's on individual news organizations, and, and they can build that in. I think Axios has done a good job of that. But there's definitely pressure 
the, I, I think the get it first pressure is stronger now. It's interesting. That stuff gets commoditized a lot faster, right? You have a scoop and it's substantive. Everybody else is basically aggregated and rewritten it, you know, five minutes later. So the scoop doesn't last all that long. Uh, but there is more pressure to be first um, and, and to be first by minutes, perhaps. So, so there's more pressure on that. And then there's the social media aspect, right, which is kind of how people not just manage social media presence, but not screwing up on there. You know, I, I said that there's a lot of pressure when you hit send the newsletter out. There's equal pressure to not, you know, make a mistake, whether it be factual or just say something really stupid on, on Twitter the, or, or on Facebook or Snapchat or wherever else that not only potentially reflects poorly on you, but more importantly, reflects poorly on your colleagues. You know, pr particularly in this kind of hypercharged partisan political environment, you know, one person, you know, we have, I think, 160 people at Axios. One person tweet, if it hasn't happened, but if one person, you know, tweeted, you know, Trump is an asshole or, you know, screw Hillary Clinton, if, if, if anyone did something like that, not only does it reflect on them, it literally will get used to reflect on every other employee at the company and every story the company writes. That's a, so you that's not the sort of thing that was true, you know, 15, 20 years ago. There wasn't mass distribution of the personal opinion you shared with your friends down the street or, you know, even with a you know larger group of people. So that's changed. And I and reporters kind of often are on these social media platforms to impart, you know, quote unquote, manage their brand. It is a place sometimes they can break very small pieces of news. It's certainly a place where you want to promote your stories and get distribution. At the same time, you can't mess it up. You, I, you've got a lot more pressure as a so-called blue check mark on Twitter as a journalist than you do as, you know, as a celebrity or, or as somebody in a different line of work. Yeah. So then next I have a quick blitz. So I'll, I'll ask you a quick question. You give me a quick answer. All right. Favorite movie? Reservoir Dogs. Oh, Tarantino guy. Yeah. Favorite movie star? Uh, favorite movie star? I'm going to go Bruce Campbell from The Evil Dead. Favorite singer or a band? Oh, it's easy. It's ACDC. Favorite book? Favorite book? I should have an answer for this. I'm just going to, I don't have a favorite book. I'll give you the last book I read because I finished it this morning, uh, which was the new uh, Bitcoin Billionaire book by Ben Resurrect. It was a good read. It, it, it's kind of the revival of the Winklevi. It's, it's an interesting read. Favorite newspaper or magazine? Historically, it was the sports section of the Boston Globe. Um, but in terms of magazine, I'll go with Fortune. I still like Fortune, and I like the people over there. It's a good read. People should buy it. Support them. <laughs> What's your favorite sport to watch? Favorite sport to watch? I'm a Boston person, uh, so I don't like sports. I like teams. Uh, whichever one of the big four is playing, Celtics, Bruins, uh, Red Sox, Patriots. Whoever's got a game on, I'll watch it. Favorite place in the United States? Salisbury Beach, Massachusetts. Favorite country to visit? So far, Italy. Who is the favorite historical figure? Favorite historical figure? That's a good, that's a very good question. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I'm not Christian, but I'll go with Jesus. He's the most interesting. Ah. The first item on your bucket list? First item on my bucket list. All right, I, I think, so I've always been terrified of this. I think it's probably to jump out of a plane. I'm terrified of planes. I hate them. I, I, I believe they're always going to crash. So this will, it, it, it's a bucket list thing, not because I want to do it, but because I think I kind of need to do it. So last question. If there is one thing you could change in the world, what would that be? One, I mean, how big do I get to go? I mean, can I cure hunger? Am I able to do that? It doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do. I think right now, right now, I want people just to start talking to each other and and stop. And this is from political period, and and stop stop being quite so tribal. We've become a really tribal society, and I think it's a shame. Thanks very much, Dan. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Accent Podcast. For more episodes, please visit theaccentpodcast.com. Until next time.